All right, so hi everyone. Um, we are going to be doing a session on uh, design thinking and how do you think like a designer but lead like a product uh, manager. Um, and this is a simple masterclass predominantly in design thinking, but of course, also to let you know how you can use it um, in your product management journey. Um, just quickly going through the agenda, uh, we're gonna of course go through what is design thinking, how does design thinking and product management fit together, then there are <clears throat> five key steps for design thinking. That's empathize, design, idea, define, ideate, prototype, and test. And then there's <clears throat> a, a neat product management plus design thinking cheat sheet that you can take note of and sort of use when you want to sort of apply. And it can help understand and guide in your product lifecycle journey of when to use <clears throat> design thinking. Um, I'm just going to take a quick uh, second to uh, introduce myself, although Karthike did a wonderful job already. So I've been um, in this industry for about seven plus years. I started up as uh, <clears throat> as a co-founder of one of uh, uh, the companies, which was called Geo Tesseract. Um, this was before our acquisition. It was not called Geo. It was called Geo. It was only called Tesseract. This was in 2016. Uh, we ran that for about three years, bootstrapped then got acquired by Geo, and uh, this was into building AR, VR headsets and solutions. Um, <clears throat> currently, I'm uh, the chief product officer at Fairdeal.market. What we're doing here is enabling B2B brands and uh, retailers to come on board and have these brands uh, sell their products into the retail um, sort of place. I have done my engineering uh, from BITS. I'm an engineer turned product manager. I believe a lot of uh, folks in this uh, group maybe like that. Um, of course, product management isn't something <clears throat> that you need to worry about, whether you need to be an engineer or you need to be a designer. Um, but you know, that's that's been my journey. Um, <clears throat> I've been uh, scuba diving a lot, uh, in fact, very recently. Um, and uh, I love reading, I love, I love traveling. And in case you want to sort of stay connected to me, that's my credentials below. With that out of the way, uh, we'll quickly begin and uh, give a very quick introduction to what is design thinking. Um, fundamentally, design thinking lies at the crux of these three questions. First being, uh, in any scenario or in any case or in any situation that we're trying to apply this, um, and when we are trying to find a solution for a problem, first of all, we want to answer, is it even a valid problem for our users? Rather, whether is, it is a desirable problem uh, that we're solving for. Um, is this solution feasible to solve, whether it is feasible, and is it viable for our business? That's the viability. So design thinking sits at the center <clears throat> of this. Um, this was something that was popularized by IDEO and Stanford uh, sort of D school. And uh, in a sense, it's very simply a human first approach to problem solving, which is very iterative, which uh, keeps customer empathy at the center. It enables experimentation and it helps collaboration. Um, of course, design-led companies are shown to outgrow uh, and perform better than companies which don't embrace a design-led solution because they end up creating solutions which may not actually make sense for the users, or they may not be feasible, or they may not be viable, as they may not be answering these three questions. Um, <clears throat> a very brief introduction to this. And now let's jump back. And of course, for a lot of you guys who are probably um, aspiring PMs, uh, you would have some sense of what product management is like. So I would uh, request you all to, uh, you know, to give in your comments and sort of give your idea of what, what you know about product management as of today. What do you think project, product management is according to you? Just type on the chat, whatever it means <clears throat> according to you. Ritu says, please go back to the previous slide. Okay. All right, coming back to this, um, if everybody can just type in the chat, what do you guys think according to you? What is product management all about? Anything? Not releasing any answers. Can you guys hear me? Can you guys, are you guys awake? Mini CEO of their own product from ideation to launch, unsure. Okay, that's good. Anybody else? I'm going to wait at least for two or three more answers before I proceed so that I know that people are involved and uh, they can uh, participate in this sort of discussion. <clears throat> so thank you, Anshul, for answering that. We'll have two more. Uh, 
Okay, nobody. Okay, one more. With the Krishna, product management boils down to ideating new features, planning and managing the backlog, understanding the generated data, and increasing user engagement to achieve business goals. Okay, fair enough. Out of creating right product for right people at the right time. All right, Vine, that's a great answer as well. Cool, I think all these three uh, are good answers. Divya wrote, writes customer representative. That's one aspect of product management. Um, Ansh writes, product forming a different iteration process. All right. Um, solving problems for users and helping business <coughs> generate revenue. Okay. Optimizing zero to one journeys of the product. All right. So <clears throat> more or less, a lot of you guys have given, um, you know, a fairly good answer, but but I, I think I'll boil down to this Venn diagram. And I'm pretty sure this is something that you guys must have seen um, a lot of times come up either when you've Google searched or when you've attended any similar sessions that um, fundamentally the product management uh, <clears throat> falls in between three key aspects wherein there is the user experience, there is technology in terms of how you build it, and then there is business um, <clears throat> in terms of whether you can make it profitable or not. And it's, it's also similar to the answers that I saw on the chat here. Um, something interesting, uh, if, if some of you may have noticed, is uh, that if you compare the two Venn diagrams that I've shown you, uh, one for design thinking and one for product management, if you keep them side by side, uh, you start not noticing that there is a very um, simple parallel that you can draw. And I'll sort of do that one by one, which is that <clears throat> desirability uh, is something that you understand when you're building the user user experience. So your designers in the team, um, and when you are working with those designers, talking to the customers, understanding whether this is something that <clears throat> that you want to build or not, um, it it is something that is very at very at the very heart of design thinking as desirability, and it is also as a function at the heart of what product manager does. Similarly, <clears throat> if you think about the feasibility aspect when you're applying design thinking processes and when you understand the technology skill set that a product manager needs to have, uh, it also goes quite hand in hand. And of course, lastly is the viability that uh, when you're applying a design thinking process, you need to build a solution that is viable. Um, and also as a product manager, you need to build a solution that essentially is, uh, is, is viable for your business. Um, what that fundamentally essentially means is that product management uh, more or less equals to design thinking. And if you look back very early on onto the very early uh, stages when product management as a field was coming up, um, this was predominantly popularized and this was predominantly adopted by the companies who were very much deeply entrenched into design thinking. And in fact, the best design thinkers or the folks who understand design thinking and can apply it on any problem uh, day in, day out, be it in their personal lives or even in their professional lives, end up becoming great product managers. So it's, it's a very important, it's a very uh, simple, yet a very powerful and very effective tool that you all uh, you know, should uh, definitely read more about and learn more about. And of course, I'll try to do my best to give you uh, an idea during this session. Uh, <clears throat> all right, so uh, just summarizing very quickly, on what essentially design thinking imparts importance to product management. Uh, <clears throat> by use of design thinking processes, we can ensure that we always keep our users first uh, while building the solution. We ensure that in, an, uh, <clears throat> in a, in a fast-paced environment, we can experiment and fail fast. We learn how does that work in the later uh, sections of this uh, masterclass. Um, we enable cross-functional collaboration, which is super duper important. Um, <clears throat> it helps to break down silos between the engineering design and the business and marketing teams. It helps us to be very resilient uh, because with design thinking, you can do a one week sprint, uh, understand what's changed, how are my users needs changing, what are the technological advance, advancements that are coming in, and what are the market conditions because of which I need to maybe uh, innovate further into the product that's already there in the market. And most importantly, it gives you a holistic approach to problem solving. It not only caters to either the functional part or the emotional part or the business aspect, but it takes all the three sort of together. Um, <clears throat> now, having gone through this, of course, this you know is just a bunch of words still. Uh, let's jump deep down and start really understanding what the design thinking process itself is like. Um, <clears throat> before that, any questions here to... Uh, 
that if, if anybody has that they didn't understand anything uh, before this, you can drop in here and I'll probably uh, reach out to them <clears throat> at the end or as, as I keep going. Uh, there's one question by Ansh, does design part of PM require UX UI? You don't need to know the tools uh, <clears throat> per se. You don't need to be great at Figma or great at uh, any of these other design tools, but you definitely need to be uh, <clears throat> very adept in terms of uh, understanding how designers think, being able to talk to them, being able to use them with you, uh, take them with you to, under to understand how does a customer think and uh, what kind of uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, feelings or what kind of thoughts does your customer have when you're trying to show them a particular demo or a mock-up. Um, <clears throat> at a fundamental level, there are five steps to the design thinking process. Um, <clears throat> uh, design thinking was, as I said, popularized by Stanford D School. So Stanford's D School website has an amazing set of resources for this, for, for the reading. We start with the empathize phase, wherein we <clears throat> try to understand our customers better. Then we define those customers and their problem statements. Then we ideate on those problem statements. We build a simple prototype and we test it out. It's a fairly simple process. It's fairly commonsensical. Uh, <clears throat> but when you try to apply it in real life, you will realize that it's more difficult than you would think. Um, and if, and of course, this particular session is still more theoretical. Um, we'll see if I can, if we can do another session at a later point, which is more hands on, more, more practical, um, <clears throat> which would be a great add on to this particular session. Uh, <clears throat> all right, let's go step by step. So the step one is essentially em empathize. Of course, I've given uh, a, a, a bit idea about what empathize uh, step does, but any any thoughts that you guys have that you want to add upon um, uh, of what do you think we would be doing in the empathize phase of design thinking? Please type in uh, on the chat, whatever your thoughts are into what do you think uh, the empathize state could mean? Find the user persona, user need, <clears throat> putting yourself in one's shoes, absolutely correct, Vivek. Understand who our users would be, ask open-ended questions, that's correct. Ashish, that's one of the techniques that we use during uh, the empathize phase. Interview users, get feedback, get to know customers by service, feeling the pain points, absolutely correct. So I think, I think you guys <clears throat> already are pretty, uh, much, uh, you know, uh, an expert more or less into this. So absolutely correct. So the most important piece uh, <clears throat> that we need to know uh, <clears throat> when we are wearing the design thinking hat or in general as PMs is that we should always think that we are the dumbest guys in the room. You know, leave your ego in, in, in your homes when you're coming to your office as a PM and just always say that, you know what, hey, I'm a dumb guy. I don't know anything about anything. I'm gonna learn from everyone <clears throat> around me, which means that first of all, we need to empathize uh, without any preconceived notions. So we <clears throat> go out, we need to understand what is our problem, what is who are our users, uh, what are their behaviors, what are their likes, what are their dislikes, um, <clears throat> and that's how we essentially em empathize. Uh, <clears throat> it's also important that <clears throat> during the empathy phase, um, we take in our engineers, our designers, our marketers, and our sales folks along, because as I said, we should always consider that we don't know anything, and we need these guys who are experts within their own fields to also come with us, and we are just helping guide everyone through a process. That's it. What The only thing that we know is this is a process. I can do steps A, B, C, D, E, D, but I'm no expert in any specific field. <clears throat> so uh, during the empathize phase, we obviously conduct other interviews, we surveys, we observe our users, um, <clears throat> or we do some sort of shadowing. Uh, and what we do while we're doing this is uh, we end up creating or we end up filling something called as an empathy map. Uh, <clears throat> and the template of that um, kind of looks like this. So it's basically got seven sections that you can see. I've also, um, you know, uh, sent a link or, you know, you can take a screenshot of this or you can just search for the empathy map canvas by David Gray. Um, now, what this does is, first of all, who are we empathizing with? Who is the person we want to understand? What is the situation they're in? What is the role in their situation? We want to understand what do they do? What do they need to do differently? What jobs do they need to do or get done? What decisions do they need to make? Or how will they will be? How will they be successful? Then we try to understand their sensory experience of when they're going through that particular problem. Like what do they see? Uh, <clears throat> if they are, let's say, looking, if you are trying to solve a problem of food delivery. So what do they see? Say they see Swiggy, they see Zomato, they see maybe even Zepto, they see also Dunzo. 
So <clears throat> what, are, what do they see in the marketplace? What do, they see, what do they see in the immediate environment? They see there's a delivery boy who keeps going around. They either see him in traffic or they see him uh, coming to deliver at the house or they see him um, <clears throat> at the restaurant. Um, what do they see others saying or doing about it? So uh, do they see others? How are they behaving or how are they reacting to this whole experience? Maybe you go to a friend's place, they have ordered food. Uh, what, have, what, have, what has been their experience with, with this particular scenario? Uh, and what are they watching and reading in this sort of area? Of course, what are they saying? So you ask them, uh, you know, how has, your, how has been your experience with this? How is uh, this working out? How is that working out? And what can we imagine uh, them saying? Uh, then what do they do? Uh, like, how do they solve this particular problem? Whether, uh, you know, uh, um, what kind of behavior are they exhibiting? What kind of uh, uh, things that, that you can imagine them doing? And what do they hear? And lastly is what do they think and feel? Um, and this is something that you basically fill it, fill on, on your own once you've, once you've taken uh, points one through six. So one, two, three, four, five, six. This is something that you come back and you try to judge and understand that, okay, these are the pains that they are uh, going through and these are the gains that they're seeing uh, currently with whatever is happening uh, with them. So in this phase, it's very important to remember, uh, we've not yet thought about what the problem is. We've not yet thought about what the solution is. It's just as on as it is, um, what is our user feeling, seeing, saying, doing, and hearing. Uh, with respect to the scenario that we're trying to build. Okay, <clears throat> any questions here? Right, so uh, Ritu had a question, difference between shadowing and observing. Uh, just to guess, so on Schumann right, writes, observe others from a distance, how they react to the product, et cetera, shadow, replicates user routines. Uh, <clears throat> right, so um, shadowing is somewhere, uh, shadowing is where you basically, uh, just observe you observe them from behind on what they are doing without giving them any input whereas observing is a technique where you give them a certain action and then you observe what they are doing so shadowing is without giving them giving them any instruction about this particular scenario and you're just sort of um observing them and observation actually is the one where you give an input and you observe them the next step is define <clears throat> now with all the uh initial information that you've gotten during the empathize phase, um, you take in, uh, you ruminate on the empathy map, ruminate, you basically think uh, more deeply onto the, uh, uh, the, the chart that you've created before, the empathy map that you've created before. And of course, you would be creating those empathy map for, uh, for each of uh, the stakeholder, which is part of that particular problem. Uh, <clears throat> you gather all of them. Um, once you gather all of them, you try to sort of group and list down their pain points and their needs. Um, here we use something called as the 5i method. There are a bunch of different techniques to sort of do this. Uh, I've only listed out one, which is the 5i method. The 5i method essentially is if you realize that something is a pain point for a user, then you ask, why is this a pain point for a user? Uh, once you've gotten an answer to that, you again ask that question, why? Uh, and you keep asking that till you sort of get to the root of what that problem is like. Uh, <clears throat> By the end of that, you uh, can essentially start drafting out something called as the how might we problem statements, which is the HMV problem statements. And the template for that essentially looks like how might we dash for dash so that dash is satisfied. Um, and we'll see some examples of that in the next slide, uh, what that probably means. And then we, of course, prioritize uh, <clears throat> these different problem statements that we're coming together with. So some examples of how do we sort of do this? This is another template uh, that is uh, present in the design tool, uh, design thinking toolbox. Um, <clears throat> and uh, what do we fill here is from the empathy map, we transfer those information right here. And we start filling out uh, these questions, like how might we, the solution uh, or the problem for so-and-so user so that their needs are fulfilled. And some examples of that is, for example, if we are trying to solve uh, for a problem like reducing food waste at, waste at home, uh, the problem statement would, would look like how would how might we help better manage food, uh, manage and utilize food supplies for households so that uh, and they can reduce food waste and save money. Uh, similarly, you can read through <clears throat> the rest of them, but this is the uh, uh, in roughly the kind of template that we follow when we are trying to define a problem statement. Um, so 
we empathize. We try to gather in the information from the users. We try to understand what are they seeing, feeling, hearing, and uh, uh, talking about a particular or saying about a particular problem. Um, from that, we try to define the problem statements individually uh, of how might we in using these HMV sort of templates. And then we jump into the ideation phase. Um, and any ideas on what would the ideation phase uh, be like? Yes, it is. so active and passive sort of observation. That's correct. Any questions so far? And just let me know if I'm going a little bit too fast or too slow. Um, I'll be happy to uh, change my pace according to. Uh, so full form of HMB is how might we? It's it's B, uh, but it's it, I mean it's W, but it's 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 <clears throat> it is HMB. Uh, Aeration is all about coming up with possible solutions, brainstorming on ideas. <clears throat> so prototyping, Anshul, is going to be the next stage uh, in ideation. We don't start prototyping yet, <clears throat> but yes, ideation is coming up with possible solutions. That's correct. Uh, and what we do here is we basically bring out our sticky notes. Uh, we write down our ideas to solve on each and every problem statement. Um, <clears throat> these ideas can be as wild or as simple as possible. Uh, we need to make sure that we are doing this in a collaborative fashion, which means that we are taking use of designers, uh, <clears throat> marketers, uh, engineers, who, are, who we basically uh, got, you know, took with us during the empathize phase uh, to uh, ideate onto this particular problem. Um, and once everybody has uh, filled in their wacky ideas and wacky solutions, we basically do a dot voting rank, uh, do, dot voting in which we basically put up all those sticky notes in a particular you know, wall and everybody goes around and sort of uh, puts a dot onto the idea that they all personally like, and that's how we sort of find them. A very simple example of that is something that's shown here. So imagine this is, something that either we're doing on Figma virtually or we're doing it in actual room. And <clears throat> you start putting your ideas here. Um, this is independent to anybody else. So you start ideating on your own that, okay, you know what? Maybe we can build an app. Maybe we can build a, <clears throat> a website. Maybe uh, I can have somebody go and collect this, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Whatever, those, whatever your, your simple, all your wackiest ideas are, uh, <clears throat> you put them on and everybody does that separately. Uh, independently. And then once everybody's done uh, their own ideation, we all go around and uh, start putting a dot on each and everybody else's sort of paper. So for example, if I am one and I like this idea, I will put a dot here. I like this idea also, I, like, I put a dot here. I put, uh, I like this idea, I put a dot here. I like this idea, I put a dot here. And uh, similarly, the rest of the guys also do that. And we then essentially rank them <clears throat> based on how many dots a particular idea gets. And remember, that this exercise is being done uh, predominantly with engineers, with uh, your marketing sales guys, and with your designers. Um, and you as an individual are predominantly facilitating the process. Of course, you're also coming up with the ideas, but your role here is more as a facilitator as opposed to an active contributor. <clears throat> and hence, uh, you know, you, you get an idea or you get a set of ideas quoted, uh, you know, across the board by all the all the different sort of parties which are participating in that particular round. So this is how we've we ranked the idea. We've gotten a certain set of um, solutions uh, that we know that we can now build. And now based on these ranking, we basically start picking up one or two, which we think we can build uh, and we start prototyping. And now here things get really interesting. Uh, generally what I've seen uh, and what I have uh, noticed uh, is that you know, this is the phase that takes the longest time. And most companies, most organizations, and most teams uh, ideally take a month to build a prototype. Uh, but if you're doing that, then you're already, you're already losing the game. Um, ideally, these prototypes should be something that is as simple as to be built in less than two to three days, or in maximum case, a week long sprint. And this includes for, this includes for hardware. Um, and the reason I emphasize about this and the reason I know that this is possible is uh, I can recollect to my days at the MIT Media Lab. So we used to have something called as uh, demo or die Thursdays. So we would start on Monday. We would start the empathy phase on the Monday morning. He would come back and do the define phase on Monday afternoon. We'd break down for, we'd break out for lunch. 
and then in the evening we would do the uh, ideation phase on tuesday morning we do one more round of ideation phase with fresh set of ideas but then we would have uh, second half of tuesday wednesday and first half of thursday which is approximately two days to basically build out a prototype and uh, and this prototype uh, is something that could be very low fidelity it could literally be a bunch of a4 papers uh, with some designs drawn or it could be a full blown figma wireframe wherein you can have something that the users can use or it can also be something that you are building if you are building a hardware then it could be something that's built using arduino or a very simple computer uh, <clears throat> or any other microprocessor chip if that if it requires some electronics or it it could be 3d printing if it requires certain set of uh, mechanical components uh, but the whole idea is that you need to be able to build out this prototype in less than uh, ideally in 2 to 3 days uh, but in maximum in a week's time the reason for this is that um, while you're using your design thinking process to come up with a solution uh, you are probably going to do this prototype stage again and again till you find that solution because always remember your first few solutions not even the first solution your first few solutions are going to be very shitty your first few ideas are going to be very wrong uh, and your first few um, empathize phases in fact also are probably going to be wrong um, you know because uh, unfortunately we as humans are not very good at listening to others and we are also not very good at defining uh, what we understood or what we learned and even more so bad at you know, sort of you know, solving them and sort of creating uh, solutions for them at the first go. It's just how we are built. And hence, it's always uh, better to look at the larger scale that, okay, what's the fastest way I can build out a prototype? Because I know this is probably not going to work and I'll need to build at least two to three more prototypes. So I would rather take the entire month for that as opposed to take a month for building one prototype and then failing. I hope that makes sense a little bit. Uh, so Kunal asks the question, is the prototype built on just basic features like in Agile or it's built on all the features? It's just built on the very basic features that is exactly solving the problem that you're trying to get. In fact, in the end, if you get some time, I do have one very interesting video of uh, of an IDEO's uh, uh, shopping cart example that will that I would like to play. Um, and I think that that will sort of cement this whole thought uh, with, you know, how they how they've done it. Um, all right, of course, prototype should be usable by the user and should give uh, users the, the taste of the entire solution. And uh, and, and these uh, prototypes is, of course, something that you can iterate upon and keep testing back with the users. All right, any questions at this? Uh, yes, I will definitely share uh, the link of the video. Should a PM create a basic prototype or leave it to the UX designer? So uh, everybody in that team contributes to building that prototype. Uh, it's uh, this is not really a separation of roles, uh, meaning that, OK, you know, as a PM, uh, I'm not going to touch that. It could be your designer, your your tech guy and you building it together, um, you know, wherein you are essentially driving the ship, your designer is designing it. And maybe you need also the tech guy to build something. Uh, maybe your tech guy is also doing a very simple design or maybe you're also designing or maybe you're also coding. It could really depend, of course, on the specific skill sets that you have in that particular team. Um, and the whole idea here is to literally, quote unquote, build it like a college project. Like when you're building out a college project, right? You're not really thinking about, Are, you know, this guy is a, is a CS guy, so he's going to code or I'm going to do that. You know, more or less, in a, when you're doing a college project, you end up doing, you know, everybody ends up doing something or the other to just sort of build it out together, maybe. You are the one who's just creating a presentation for you know to, to show this to the user um so it, it could be that uh depends on what your skills are what your strengths or weaknesses are uh, but definitely think of it more like a collaborative thing as opposed to something that you are offloading to somebody else on your team um <clears throat> as doing it i hope that answers your question vivek yeah. cool um so any any questions up until now i know i've, I've rushed through the first four steps and you know that's that was the core of it we've done empathizing with the users where we understand what are they hearing saying seeing um and uh, talking about the uh, uh, about the statement or about about the scenario from there we go ahead and we define the problem statements itself wherein we use the how might we statements uh, how might we so and so so that my user uh, can you know uh, do can, can basically solve the problem that we're talking about. 
uh, and then from those ideas from these from those ideas we start dot voting them we start ranking them and the ones which we think are the most uh, important or the ones which we think are the most relevant we go ahead and we build a prototype of and then <clears throat> we go to the next stage um, so any questions so far anything that uh, <clears throat> that you all want to uh, sort of know uh, or i want or want to repeat before i move on to the test phase Now, of course, uh, this is the time that you go back to your users and you test, uh, start testing your prototype or your prototypes. Um, your method for your testing could be you do a bunch of usability tests or you do an A-B testing or you run a pilot program. Um, again, here the idea is to <clears throat> give them um, as best a prototype as you can um, so that you can get as best uh, a feedback on the ideas that you've generated and the prototypes that you've built. Uh, then you evaluate those test results and then you iterate on the solution and you restart either from step two, three or four as needed. Um, now it's very, very important that you know that design thinking as a process is not a linear process, rather it's a circular process, meaning that the moment you come out of your test phase, you more often than not would go back to step two, step three or step four, wherein once you come out of a test phase, you would want to define again you would want to uh, ideate again, or you might want to build a prototype again and sort of do that whole <clears throat> cycle again from wherever you sort of stop, right? So <clears throat> that's uh, that's essentially you know, at, at a core of, of why you need to be very fast as building a prototype, why you need to be very quick on <clears throat> building uh, and sort of uh, uh, you know testing out these prototypes. Um, because as I said, it's very, very important to know that you will probably not get the answer in the first go we we'll probably need to do these steps again again. <clears throat> How to approach a product that's already built but needs improvement? That's a great question. So you can probably use that as your prototype, right? So what you can probably do is you can uh, go back to your users, empathize with them fresh so that you as, as, as a person who's probably entering into uh, uh, you know, a space wherein where a product already exists, you uh, are empathizing with them without telling them about your product or without telling them about your solution today, but you're just trying to understand them from a very fresh perspective. Uh, <clears throat> then during the define phase, you again do that fresh without even having any knowledge about what the product that you've built already. Uh, <clears throat> you can see whether your product which is already built, does that fit into any of the problem statements already? If it doesn't, that already probably puts a red flag either from a point of view that maybe you didn't define the problem well, maybe you didn't understand your customers well, if the product is in fact working very good in the market, but is, you know, but but you you can't logically come to your product uh, idea, your, your product's idea or the product which is already built, um, that as an idea to the solution. Uh, and if it is, then you can use your product as the prototype and you can go back to your customers and do uh, the test phase. Of course, during the test phase, I'm pretty sure you will find a lot more um, in terms of what's working, what's not working, and whether those initial problems are getting solved or not. Let's say if those problems are getting solved, <clears throat> you would still have more problems that you would have identified during the define stage because the define stage, as I said, is a bunch is uh, you know or rather the idea stage idea stage you you can see that you know all of your team members would have come up with at least four or five different solutions which means you probably have at least 20 different solutions to a particular problem and you probably you know on, your product only has maybe uh, five ten or five to ten of those um, uh, of those solutions as features so you would still get the rest of them you could again build out a prototype of that either add it into your product or as a separate small prototype, test it with your customers and still get that feedback. I hope that answers your question, Minal. Minal, sorry. Um, <clears throat> and Anshul, in the iteration process, can we select more than one idea and then continue to process? Absolutely. So it, of course, very fairly depends <clears throat> on the bandwidth of the team that you are running this entire process with. So if uh, you feel that you have the bandwidth to build two prototypes, for um, uh, you know, for two different solutions, then of course you can do that. If you feel that you can do three, 
you know, if you have their bandwidth, you can do that. But it's important to remember that you want <clears throat> to take the shortest amount of time to go back to the customer. Remember that you spoke to the customer on day one and <clears throat> day two, day three, day four, you probably don't want to go later than day four or day five back to them with a solution. This is also something that uh, will excite them a lot, will make them more open to what you're building because they can see that, you know, hope, oh, you know, you are really, really um, enthusiastic about, you know, solving the problem. That's why you've come back in four days or five days with a solution. Of course, they're not looking at a, at a, at a very sexy or a very, you know, good looking solution, um, you know, but still that would be something that uh, would be great. So of course you can do that on sure. Depends on, you know, what bandwidth you have. Uh, Riddhi, what is a pilot's program testing? So a pilot program testing is uh, <clears throat> something, uh, I don't know if you've uh, seen, for example, Google's, uh, Android has a beta program. Um, so you basically enroll, you know, you, you probably, <clears throat> uh, if it's a solution that you think is is common for a lot more people than the sample set that you've used to empathize with, let's say you empathize with five people, but you know that, you know, my entire local community has this problem. You could probably send out a survey form or a, or a sign up link to all of them, uh, get them signed up onto a particular pilot and then roll out the prototype to them. If it's a digital prototype or even for a physical prototype, you can probably invite a bunch of participants to sort of do a pilot program. So uh, a pilot program essentially <clears throat> is something that you get a group of people to sign up and then you do uh, <clears throat> the program or the testing. All right, and as I said, it's important to know that uh, you don't want to, you know, be perfect here. Uh, you can never be perfect, in fact. And uh, and you know, and the whole idea is to basically build fast and, of course, fail fast. That's my tablet. Yeah. Um, and um, of course, I'm gonna conclude with uh, of, with the video eventually. But but you know, this is what I always keep handy, uh, and it's it's kind of a very uh, simple and you know sweet way to <clears throat> to understand how does the product management lifecycle work with the design thinking process. So you may be familiar with this with these stages as aspiring product managers or as product managers. If not, of course, you can go back and you know read upon this as well. Uh, this is, of course, also something that um, is uh, kind of, you know, different people talk about it in different ways. I mean, they have different names for these phases, but more or less, these are the same phases that you go through a discovery phase, then you go to a design prototyping phase, you go to a development testing phase, then you go to a launch and iteration phase, and then you go to a continuous improvement phase, which is similar to what Meenal had asked, um, I think, for the continuous <laughs> improvement. Um, so the way that you look at it uh, from a design thinking process is your discovery phase is equivalent to the empathize and define phase. Your design and prototyping is the ideate and prototype phase. Your develop and testing is the prototype and test phase. And your launch and iteration phase is just the test phase. Um, <clears throat> because uh, while you're sort of testing, what your launch essentially means is literally a test at a, at a slightly larger scale than what you may have done with a smaller set of people during uh, during this phase. Um, so that's still, you know, it still remains a testing phase. And then a continuous improvement phase is essentially that you are <clears throat> internalizing and doing this design sprints. Um, so I don't know if you guys are aware, for example, Google has, uh, you know, Google does this uh, <clears throat> thing called design sprints, which is essentially a five day uh, or a seven day sometimes sprint, which is different from the product management or the software development lifecycle sprints that we are more accustomed to, the agile sprints, sprints that we are more accustomed to. Those design sprints are actually these design thinking sprints that they do. And um, so does Uber, so does Spotify. So the, so the, so the very big software companies that you see that uh, have, have grown massively um, at their core lies these design sprints. And these are different from the agile sprints. Agile sprints are more for development. Um, and these are more for, 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 for this continuous improvement. But what you would have is you would have a set of very small tactical team who would run these five-day design thinking sprints, either on the existing product or on something new. Uh, some new problem statement, they would build out this prototype and, and their job is simply to take an idea or take a problem from zero to one. And then they push it out to the actual development teams where it goes through the agile process where the product manager creates stories and you know, does all of that, which, which I know all of you guys must be <clears throat> more or less aware about. Um, so it's slightly different from that. Um, and, you know, and yet very similar in the sense that 
um, you as a PM, uh, when you either you know enter a new organization or are part of a new or or, or are already part of an organization, um, you can popularize this, and I think that is something that you know would be a great contribution uh, that you would, would that you would uh, you know bring to the to the table for your company. Yes, so Ritu, you're right. Uh, you I mean you don't need a management <clears throat> degree for a product manager. Very honestly, product manager, you don't really need any degree. I mean, you need a degree to enter a company because you know that's how they shortlist you, unfortunately or fortunately, I don't know. Uh, but, but as a product manager, you don't really need a particular degree per se. I would say you need more to be a critical thinker, you need to be a people's person, and you need to be able to follow certain processes, more or less. Um, and that's Roughly, how I think uh, you know, product manager could could basically be. Uh, I'll we'll come to that, uh, Nelson. Uh, and yeah, so I think uh, Karthike, do we still have some time? Can I? It's an eight minute video. I would like to play it in full if that's something that's possible. Companies secret weapon. Can you see? Can you hear it now? Innovation. Yeah, it's perfect. the product design folk and said take something old and familiar like say the shopping cart and completely redesign it for us in just five days ABC News correspondent Jack Smith tells us what happened next nine in the morning day one and these people have a deadline to meet so welcome to the kickoff of the shopping cart project this is Palo Alto California in the heart of Silicon Valley and these are designers at IDEO, probably the most influential product development firm in the world. IDEO has designed everything from high-tech medical equipment to the 25-foot mechanical whale in the movie Free Willy and the first computer mouse for Apple. Smith ski goggles, Nike sunglasses, NEC computer screens, hundreds of products we take for granted. The point is that we're not actually experts at any given area you know we're kind of experts on the process of how you design stuff so we don't care if you give us a toothbrush a toothpaste tube a tractor a space shuttle you know a chair it's all the same to us we like want to figure out how to innovate in in by using our process applying it project leader is peter skillman a 35 year old stanford engineer project leader because he's good with groups not because of seniority he's only been at ido for six years the rest of the team is eclectic but that's typical here. Whitney Mortimer, Harvard MBA. Peter Coughlin, linguist. Tom Kelly, Dave's brother, marketing expert. Jane Fulton Suri, psychologist. Alex Kazax, 26, a biology major, who's turned down medical school three times because he's having too much fun at IDEO. Safety emerges early as an important issue. 22,000 child injuries a year, which is, and so they're hospitalized injuries. I mean, th yeah. there are many others. And theft. It turns out a lot of carts are stolen. As the team works, it becomes clear there are no titles here, no permanent assignments. And the other side says, gives us a lot of help, says, be safe. That's <laughs> it. So I'll give you a big red ball on a, on, a, on, a, on a post, and that says you're a big guy. If you got a ball, you're a senior vice president. <laughs> you know, what do I care? The desk, the red ball, it's all the same. <laughs> In a very innovative culture, you can't have a kind of hierarchy of here's the boss and the next person down, the next person down, the next person down, because it's impossible that the boss is the one who's had the insightful experience with shopping carts. It's just not possible. The team splits into groups to find out firsthand what the people who use, make, and repair shopping carts really think. Okay, go. The problem with the plastic cart is the wind catches it. Yeah. And these things uh, have been clocked at 35 across the parking lot. <laughs> oh, man. That's actually a pretty good point. The, the trick is to find these real experts and so that you can learn much more quickly than you could by just kind of doing it in the normal way and, and trying to learn about it yourself. From everything I read, these things aren't that safe either, you know? Right. Um, so probably the seat itself is going to have to be redesigned. One of the interesting things for me is looking at how people really don't like to let go of the cart, except for the professional shopper, whose strategy is to leave the cart at various places. 3.30 in the afternoon, and the group is back at IDEO. There is no let-up. Each team is going to demonstrate and communicate and share everything that they've learned today. A uh, shopping cart has been clocked at 35 miles an hour, traveling through a parking lot in the wind. We were in the store, what, two hours? and. 
and it was truly frightening just to see the kind of stuff going on. You ought to designate some people to make damn sure that the store owner's point of view is represented. After nine straight hours, the team is tired. They call it a day. So, um, Everybody cool? Well, uh, that's great. Thanks a lot. We had a great time today. Yeah. Yeah. IDEO's mantra for innovation is written everywhere. One conversation at a time. Stay focused. Encourage wild ideas. Defer judgment. Build on the ideas of others. Uh, that's the hardest thing for people to do is to uh, restrain themselves from uh, uh, criticizing an idea. So if anybody starts to nail an idea, they get the bell. You know. <laughs> the ideas pour out and are posted on the walls. Oh, the blind, the, the privacy blind. Like when you're buying six cases of condoms, you, no one sees. So if it doesn't nest, we don't have a solution. Organized chaos. Uh, it's not organized. Um, what it is is it's focused chaos. Vote with your post-it, not, not with an idea that's cool, but with an idea that's cool and buildable. Um, if, it's, if it's too far out there and it can't be built in a day, then I don't think we should vote on it. Enlightened trial and error succeeds over the planning of lone genius. Enlightened trial and error succeeds over the planning of the lone genius. If anything sums up IDEO's approach, that is it. Worried that the team is drifting, what can only be called a group of self-appointed adults under Dave Kelly holds an informal side session. Four or five teams. Four or five. Four or five teams, and we, and we give each team a need area. It becomes very autocratic for a very short period of time in defining what things people are going to work on. If you don't work under time constraints, you, you could never get anything done because it's a messy process and go on forever. Back at the shop, it is 6 o'clock, and the four mock-ups are ready for showing. Baskets also can be, if you think you will have more volume, baskets can be put in. A modular shopping cart you pile hand baskets onto. A high-tech cart that gets you through the traffic jam at checkout. That you could mount a scanner on the shopping cart so that you as the customer, as you pull it off the shelf, would scan each item. One that's built around child safety, and another that lets shoppers talk to the supermarket staff remotely. Uh, yeah, where can I find a yogurt? But the adults, again, decide more work needs to be done before the mock-ups can be combined into one last prototype. Why don't we have all the carts come up here for a second? I think you take a piece of each one of these ideas and kind of back it off a little bit and then put it in the, yeah, in the right. design. The design is still not there. But there's another motto at IDEO, fail often in order to succeed sooner. And some of the team will be up half the night trying to put together a design that finally does work. There it is! There it is! So we took the best elements out of each prototype. The cart, which is designed to cost about the same as today's carts, is different in every other way. What do you think? <laughs> Well, I, I'm very proud of the team. I think it's, it's great. This, does this work for you? Works for me great. Yeah. It's also beautiful. The cart's wheels turn 90 degrees so it can move All sideways. Side no more lifting up the rear in a tight spot. And you shop in a totally different way. The bags are hung on hooks on the cart's frame. Remember, there is no basket here. At yeah. first, I was a little shocked, but I think it's you have some fantastic ideas here. It needs a little refining, but I think that it's great. I mean, we would, we would want them. She also gave us some really good comments about how we can make this thing better. A lot of hours. Also, an open mind, a boss who demands fresh ideas be quirky and clash with his, a belief that chaos can be constructive, and teamwork. A great deal of teamwork. And these are the recipe for how innovation takes place. This is Jack Smith for Nightline. <coughs> Right, yeah, <clears throat> so that, that was uh, about it. I will share the link of the video for sure. So all, all of what we've sort of learned, right? I mean, <clears throat> um, it's nobody's a genius, right? You need to talk to the experts around, uh, be it your stakeholders, uh, understanding from them what the problem is like, what are they thinking, hearing, feeling about, about this problem? That's where you empathize. Um, you're not only empathizing with the person who's going through the problem, but also everyone around everyone around it in that scenario you went with the <clears throat> folks who uh you know who are at the what are the shopping mall uh the customers the ones who build shopping carts the ones who uh you know who are the uh the shopkeepers essentially um <clears throat> then uh, 
anything that you takes longer to build, you don't want to build that because you know you won't get feedback because you want to fail fast. You want to you want to do iterations very fast. Um, <clears throat> no no ideas are being judged. Uh, you know it's a very open way that you know every idea is welcome. Everything is welcome. Um, and of course, you go back as fast as you can to the customer, get some feedback, iterate on it, and then get back again. Um, <clears throat> so all of what we what we what we've learned um, during this session. I hope this was something that you can take a leaf and sort of apply into your own product uh, <clears throat> management journey uh, and sort of add value to wherever you are working or are aspiring to work. Um, and yeah, all the best. Um, do reach out to me for any of the for the questions that you guys have. And uh, yes, I will, of course, take some questions on the chat till then. Um, so so I'll start with Nelson. How can I gain PM experience without PM experience? I think that's a great question. You can uh, slightly unconventional, but you could probably, uh, <laughs> you know, you could probably ask Chat GBD for some uh, good product management uh, scenarios, and you can build a case study around it. So you can build your portfolio. Um, you know, trying to uh, see how you can solve those problems either use Chat GPT or you know go around, look in the internet. Uh, what would be good product? Uh, problems to solve and probably start gaining experience by building your own portfolio around it. If you don't, uh, you know, get to get a chance to work at a company. Uh, what would be a growth journey as a PM in a company? Which designation or where does one start from? Uh, so traditionally, uh, in big companies, business analysts are the ones who, you know, who who eventually, I mean, they they enter the company right out of graduation as BAs, business analysts, and then they graduate to becoming PMs as they rose that is the ladder um but it could you know it you could also transition into a pm role from either a designer or an engineer or a marketing or a sales guy if your company sort of allows that if you show the acumen of just being a good problem solver and a good people person um i think ritu's question can be answered by kartike at a later point uh share the video link then <clears throat> what is the ideal outcome for a design sprint an ideal outcome for a design sprint is your customer saying Oh my God, you've solved my problem. That's the ideal outcome for design speed. Any book suggestion for design thinking? Uh, I Nothing specific comes to my mind, but I think uh, uh, Hooked is a good book overall, uh, be it for design thinking or for, or for product management. Um, I'll surely find some links and probably share it uh, over. There, is a, there, there, is a couple, there are a couple of books by IDO itself. Uh, hold on, let me just let's go. What was it called? Change by design. Yes. Yeah. So change by design is one good book that I remember. Change by design and art of innovation. Yeah. And yes, Indian profile. Yeah. So that's about it from my side. Um, Karthik, over to you. I guess we are good to go. All right, thank you, everyone. Have a good so, evening. Have a good weekend. Thank you. Bye-bye, guys. Have a great weekend. I hope you all learned something new today and you enjoyed the entire session. Bye-bye. Have a great weekend.